Chapter 15 of The Warlord of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Warlord of Mars. Chapter 15 Rewards. With the realization that Dejah Thoris was no longer within the throne room came the belated recollection of the dark face that I had glimpsed peering from behind the draperies that backed the throne of Salentis Ole, at the moment that I had first come so unexpectedly upon the strange scene being enacted within the chamber. Why had the sight of that evil countenance not warned me to greater caution? Why had I permitted the rapid development of new situations to efface the recollection of that menacing danger? But, alas, vain regret would not erase the calamity that had befallen. Once again had Dejah Thoris fallen into the clutches of that arch-fiend, Thurid, the black dator of the firstborn. Again was all my arduous labor gone for naught. Now I realized the cause of the rage that had been writ so large upon the features of Matai Shang, and the cruel pleasure that I had seen upon the face of Fedor. They had known or guessed the truth and the Hecador of the Holy Therns, who had evidently come to the chamber in the hope of thwarting Salensus Old in his contemplated perfidy against the high priest who coveted Dejah Thoris for himself, realized that Thurit had stolen the prize from beneath his very nose. Fedor's pleasure had been due to her realization of what this last cruel blow would mean to me, as well as to a partial satisfaction of her jealous hatred for the Princess of Helium. My first thought was to look beyond the draperies at the back of the throne, for there it was that I had seen Thurid. With a single jerk I tore the priceless stuff from its fastenings, and there before me was revealed a narrow doorway behind the throne. No question entered my mind but that here lay the opening of the avenue of escape which Thurid had followed, and had there been it would have been dissipated by the sight of a tiny jeweled ornament which lay a few steps within the corridor beyond. As I snatched up the bauble I saw that it bore the device of the Princess of Helium, and then, pressing it to my lips, I dashed madly along the winding way that led gently downward toward the lower galleries of the palace. I had followed but a short distance when I came upon the room in which Solon formerly had held sway. His dead body still lay where I had left it, nor was there any sign that another had passed through the room since I had been there, but I knew that two had done so. Thurid, the Black Dator, and Dejah Thoris. For a moment I paused uncertain as to which of the several exits from the apartment would lead me upon the right path. I tried to recollect the directions which I had heard Thurid repeat to Solon, and at last, slowly, as though through a heavy fog, the memory of the words of the firstborn came to me. Follow a corridor, passing three diverging corridors upon the right then into the fourth right-hand corridor to where three corridors meet. Here again follow to the right, hugging the left wall closely to avoid the pit. At the end of this corridor I shall come to a spiral runway which I must follow down instead of up. After that the way is along but a single branchless corridor." And I recalled the exit at which he had pointed as he spoke. It did not take me long to start upon that unknown way, nor did I go with caution although I knew that there might be grave dangers before me. Part of the way was black as sin, but for the most it was fairly well lighted. The stretch where I must hug the left wall to avoid the pits was darkest of them all, and I was nearly over the edge of the abyss before I knew that I was near the danger spot. A narrow ledge, scarce a foot wide, was all that had been left to carry the initiated past that frightful cavity, into which the unknowing must surely have toppled at the first step but at last I had won safely beyond it, and then a feeble light made the balance of the way plain, until, at the end of the last corridor, I came suddenly out into the glare of day upon a field of snow and ice. Clad for the warm atmosphere of the hothouse city of Cadabra, the sudden change to arctic frigidity was anything but pleasant. But the worst of it was that I knew I could not endure the bitter cold, almost naked as I was, and that I would perish before ever I could overtake Thurid and Dejah Thoris. To be thus blocked by nature, who had had all the arts and wiles of cunning man pitted against him, seemed a cruel fate, and as I staggered back into the warmth of the tunnel's end I was as near hopelessness as I ever have been. I had by no means given up my intention of continuing the pursuit, 
for if needs be I would go ahead though I perished ere ever I reached my goal, but if there were a safer way it were well worth the delay to attempt to discover it, that I might come again to the side of Dejah Thoris in fit condition to do battle for her. Scarce had I returned to the tunnel than I stumbled over a portion of a fur garment that seemed fastened to the floor of the corridor close to the wall. In the darkness I could not see what held it, but by groping with my hands I discovered that it was wedged beneath the bottom of a closed door. Pushing the portal aside, I found myself upon the threshold of a small chamber, the walls of which were lined with hooks from which depended suits of the complete outdoor apparel of the yellow men. Situated as it was at the mouth of a tunnel leading from the palace, it was quite evident that this was the dressing-room used by the nobles leaving and entering the hothouse city, and that Thurid, having knowledge of it, had stopped here to outfit himself and Dejah Thoris, before venturing into the bitter cold of the arctic world beyond. In his haste he had dropped several garments upon the floor and the tell-tale fur that had fallen partly within the corridor had proven the means of guiding me to the very spot he would least have wished me to have knowledge of. It required but the matter of a few seconds to don the necessary orlux skin clothing, with the heavy fur-lined boots that are so essential to a part of the garmenture of one who would successfully contend with the frozen trails and the icy winds of the bleak Northland. Once more I stepped beyond the tunnel's mouth to find the fresh tracks of Thurid and Dejah Thoris in the new-fallen snow. Now at last was my task an easy one, for though the going was rough in the extreme I was no longer vexed by doubts as to the direction I should follow, or harassed by darkness or hidden dangers. Through a snow-covered canyon the way led up toward the summit of low hills. Beyond these it dipped again into another canyon only to rise a quarter-mile farther on toward a pass which skirted the flank of a rocky hill. I could see by the signs of those who had gone before that when Dejah Thoris had walked she had been continually holding back, and that the black man had been compelled to drag her. For other stretches only his footprints were visible, deep and close together in the heavy snow, and I knew from these signs that then he had been forced to carry her and I could well imagine that she had fought him fiercely every step of the way. As I came round the jutting promontory of the hill's shoulder, I saw that which quickened my pulses and set my heart to beating high, for within a tiny basin between the crest of this hill and the next stood four people before the mouth of a great cave, and beside them upon the gleaming snow rested a flyer, which had evidently but just been dragged from its hiding-place. The four were Dejah Thoris, Fedor, Thurid, and Matai Shang. The two men were engaged in a heated argument, the father of Thurn's threatening, while the blacks scoffed at him as he went about the work at which he was engaged. As I crept toward them cautiously, that I might come as near as possible before being discovered, I saw that finally the men appeared to have reached some sort of a compromise, for with Fedor's assistance, they both set about dragging the resisting Dejah Thoris to the flyer's deck. Here they made her fast, and then both again descended to the ground to complete the preparations for departure. Fedor entered the small cabin upon the vessel's deck. I had come to within a quarter of a mile of them when Matai Shang espied me. I saw him seize Thurid by the shoulder, wheeling him around in my direction as he pointed to where I was now plainly visible for the moment that I knew I had been perceived I cast aside every attempt at stealth and broke into a mad race for the flyer. The two redoubled their efforts at the propeller at which they were working, and which, very evidently, was being replaced after having been removed for some purpose of repair. They had the thing completed before I had covered half the distance that lay between me and them, and then both made a rush for the boarding ladder. Thurid was the first to reach it and with the agility of a monkey clambered swiftly to the boat's deck, where a touch of the button controlling the buoyancy tanks sent the craft slowly upward, though not with the speed that marks the well-conditioned flyer. I was still some hundred yards away as I saw them rising from my grasp. Back by the city of Cadabra lay a great fleet of mighty flyers, the ships of Helium and Tarth that I had saved from destruction earlier in the day but before ever I could reach them Thurid could easily make good his escape. 
As I ran, I saw Matai Shang clambering up the swaying, swinging ladder toward the deck, while above him leaned the evil face of the firstborn. A trailing rope from the vessel's stern put new hope in me, for if I could but reach it before it whipped too high above my head, there was yet a chance to gain the deck by its slender aid. That there was something radically wrong with the flyer was evident from its lack of buoyancy, and the further fact that, though Thurid had turned twice to the starting lever, the boat still hung motionless in the air, except for a slight drifting with a low breeze from the north. Now Matai Shang was close to the gunwale. A long, claw-like hand was reaching up to grasp the metal rail. Thurid leaned farther down toward his co-conspirator. Suddenly a raised dagger gleamed in the upflung hand of the black. Down it drove toward the white face of the father of Thurns. With a loud shriek of fear the holy Hecador grasped frantically at the menacing arm. I was almost to the trailing rope by now. The craft was still rising slowly, the while it drifted from me. Then I stumbled on the icy way, striking my head upon a rock as I fell sprawling but an arm's length from the rope, the end of which was now just leaving the ground. With the blow upon my head came unconsciousness. It could not have been more than a few seconds that I lay senseless there upon the northern ice, while all that was dearest to me drifted farther from my reach in the clutches of that black fiend, for when I opened my eyes Thurid and Matai Shang yet battled at the ladder's top, and the flyer drifted but a hundred yards farther to the south, but the end of the trailing rope was now a good thirty feet above the ground. Goaded to madness by the cruel misfortune that had tripped me when success was almost within my grasp, I tore frantically across the intervening space, and just beneath the rope's dangling end I put my earthly muscles to the supreme test. With a mighty, cat-like bound, I sprang upward toward that slender strand, the only avenue which yet remained that could carry me to my vanishing love. A foot above its lowest end my fingers closed. Tightly as I clung I felt the rope slipping, slipping through my grasp. I tried to raise my free hand to take a second hold above my first, but the change of position that resulted caused me to slip more rapidly toward the end of the rope. Slowly I felt the tantalizing thing escaping me. In a moment all that I had gained would be lost, then my fingers reached a knot at the very end of the rope and slipped no more. With a prayer of gratitude upon my lips I scrambled upward toward the boat's deck. I could not see Thurid and Matai Shang now, but I heard the sounds of conflict and thus knew that they still fought the thern for his life and the black for the increased buoyancy that relief from the weight of even a single body would give the craft. Should Matai Shang die before I reached the deck, my chances of ever reaching it would be slender indeed, for the black dator need but cut the rope above me to be freed from me forever, for the vessel had drifted across the brink of a chasm into whose yawning depths my body would drop to be crushed to a shapeless pulp should Thurid reach the rope now. At last my hand closed upon the ship's rail, and that very instant a horrid shriek rang out below me that sent my blood cold and turned my horrified eyes downward to a shrieking, hurtling, twisting thing that shot downward into the awful chasm beneath me. It was Matai Shang, holy Hecador, father of Therns, gone to his last accounting. Then my head came above the deck and I saw Thurid, dagger in hand, leaping toward me. He was opposite the forward end of the cabin, while I was attempting to clamber aboard near the vessel's stern. But a few paces lay between us. No power on earth could raise me to that deck before the infuriated black would be upon me. My end had come. I knew it. But had there been a doubt in my mind, the nasty leer of triumph upon that wicked face would have convinced me. Beyond Lurid I could see my Dejah Thoris wide-eyed and horrified, struggling at her bonds. That she should be forced to witness my awful death made my bitter fate seem doubly cruel. I ceased my efforts to climb across the gunwale. Instead I took a firm grasp upon the rail with my left hand and drew my dagger. I should at least die as I had lived, fighting. As Third came opposite the cabin's doorway, a new element projected itself into the grim tragedy of the air that was being enacted upon the deck of Matai Shang's disabled flyer. 
It was Fedor. With flushed face and disheveled hair, and eyes that betrayed the recent presence of mortal tears, above which this proud goddess had always held herself, she leapt to the deck directly before me. In her hand was a long, slim dagger. I cast a last look upon my beloved princess, smiling as men should who are about to die. Then I turned my face up toward Fedor, waiting for the blow. Never have I seen that beautiful face more beautiful than it was at that moment. It seemed incredible that one so lovely could yet harbor within her fair bosom a heart so cruel and relentless, and today there was a new expression in her wondrous eyes that I never before had seen there, an unfamiliar softness and a look of suffering. Thurid was beside her now, pushing past to reach me first, and then what happened happened so quickly that it was all over before I could realize the truth of it. Fedor's slim hand shot out to close upon the black's dagger wrist. Her right hand went high with its gleaming blade. "'That for Matai Shang!' she cried, and buried her blade deep in the dator's breast. "'That for the wrong you would have done, Deja Thoris!' And again the sharp steel sank into the bloody flesh. "'And that, and that, and that!' she shrieked, "'for John Carter, Prince of Helium!' And with each word her sharp point pierced the vile heart of the great villain. Then, with a vindictive shove, she cast the carcass of the firstborn from the deck to fall in awful silence after the body of his victim. I had been so paralyzed by surprise that I had made no move to reach the deck during the awe-inspiring scene which I had just witnessed, and now I was to be further amazed by her next act, for Fedor extended her hand to me and assisted me to the deck, where I stood gazing at her in unconcealed and stupefied wonderment. A wan smile touched her lips. It was not the cruel and haughty smile of the goddess with which I was familiar. "'You wonder, John Carter,' she said, "'what strange thing has wrought this change in me. I will tell you. It is love. Love of you.' And when I darkened my brows in disapproval of her words, she raised an appealing hand. "'Wait,' she said. It is a different love from mine, it is the love of your princess, Deja Thoris, for you that has taught me what true love may be, what it should be, and how far from real love was my selfish and jealous passion for you. Now I am different, now could I love as Deja Thoris loves, and so my only happiness can be to know that you and she are once more united, for in her alone can you find true happiness. But I am unhappy, because of the wickedness I have wrought. I have many sins to expiate, and though I be deathless, life is all too short for the atonement. But there is another way, and if Fedor, daughter of the holy Hecador of the holy Therns, has sinned, she has this day already made partial reparation, and lest you doubt the sincerity of her protestations and her avowal of a new love that embraces Deja Thoris also, she will prove her sincerity in the only way that lies open. Having saved you for another, Fedor leaves you to her embraces." With her last word she turned and leapt from the vessel's deck into the abyss below. With a cry of horror I sprang forward in a vain attempt to save the life that for two years I would so gladly have seen extinguished. I was too late. With tear-dimmed eyes I turned away that I might not see the awful sight beneath. A moment later I had struck the bonds from Deja Thoris, and as her dear arms went about my neck and her perfect lips pressed to mine, I forgot the horrors that I had witnessed and the suffering that I had endured in the rapture of my reward. End of chapter 15